you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Philippians. As my buddy Bernard said earlier, we, we have a Philippians challenge that we're doing as a church as we're taking our time going through this series. And that is this, just to read one chapter of the book of Philippians every single day. And you might say, well, Jeff, there's only four chapters. I know. So when you're done with the fourth one, then you just start back at one, like Brian McKnight said. So you just start back over at one, and you, and you, begin, you begin again. You can read the entire book of Philippians in all of 15 minutes. You could literally just sit outside under a tree today, this afternoon. It'll take you 15 minutes, and your soul will say thank you for doing so. But if you just take one chapter a day, let it sit, let it resonate. Let the words speak to you. When, I, when, I'm, when I'm preparing a, a message, when I'm, when I'm taking time with God and, and, and really encountering Him in preparation for the sermon on Sunday, I, I always take time after I've kind of set up what I think the Lord would have me say, and then I just sit and I reread the text over and over again, and I, I wait till it begins to talk to me. I, I, call, I, wait for the, I wait for the sermon to speak to me. It needs to preach to me. It needs to be real to me. It needs to be life in me. Sometimes I cry over the word. Sometimes I laugh over it. Sometimes I'm on my knees. Sometimes I'm at my desk. But my desire is that the word would speak to me. I love the word of God. I love the word. And so as you pick up the Philippians challenge and, and do this with us, just read one chapter Every single day, I'm telling you, you're going to see a change in your life. All right, book of Philippians. We're going to go to chapter one. Yes, we're still in chapter one. We're in week three. If you're already there, say amen. Super Christians, you beat me. You beat the pastor. I'm not there yet. All right, there we go. Okay, so the book of Philippians, here we are. Chapter one. We're going to pick it up at verses three, and we're going to read through 12. And I'm going to read out of the ESV, uh, and it begins this way. So Paul, is he's greeted them, and then he goes into this uh, brief part from verses 3 through 12 that are just beautiful. He says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Can we say that together? I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you need to remind yourself, there's a good work. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with, uh, with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. And that, that scripture there in my Bible, I have it highlighted and I do these symbols in my Bible, I actually put an F there and, and I circle it, not for fun, but for our family. It's one of my prayers that for us, for our family, for my children, that our, our love may abound more and more. That we would grow in knowledge and discernment. That we'd be able to approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless. It's a good prayer to pray over your family, men. Why, why is this so important? Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to me has really served to advance the the gospel. I titled this message Process and Promise, Embracing the Path to Transformation. There, you got to understand, Paul's writing this to the Philippian church, and he founded the church. So he was the evangelist, the pastor, he was the everything, and he shows up there in Philippi and helps begin this work, and then he continues on out of town planting churches. He would come back to the Philippian church a few different times. But he's writing this letter 
while under house arrest in Rome. And Paul thoroughly understands what it means to be in process. He thoroughly understands what that would look like. And I just want to show you a timeline of Paul's ministry, if you're not familiar with it. He's converted around A.D. 37. And uh, during the, the time of his conversion, it's obviously a number of years after Jesus was crucified, after he rose from the dead, and after he ascended into heaven. It was a number of years after that. Most theologians, we don't have this confirmed, but most theologians actually believe that during the height of Jesus' ministry, the three and a half years when he was ministering, that Paul was probably in his early to mid-twenties when all that took place. So he knew about this radical rabbi. He knew about this guy that was out there that was healing the sick and, and delivering people. He, he knew about this guy. He knew about the claims. He knew about the crucifixion. And he knew about this crazy sect of Judaism that he felt at the time was totally anti the things of God. And so Paul gets radically saved on the road to Damascus. You can read it about it in the book of Acts. And then around AD 37 to 40, he spends three years in Arabia. And then he eventually comes to Jerusalem. So for three years, he actually sat under great teaching and learned. And, and, and sometimes people can be so ready for the next that they don't take time to sit and rest in what God wants you to learn. Paul gets saved. Now, he, he's going to be the most radical church planter that we know of in the history of the world, at least especially in the first century church. But at the beginning of his ministry, notice what he did. He sat and he rested and he sat under other teachers. That's a good word. And then in, in, three years later, he ends up finally visiting Jerusalem. And when he visits Jerusalem, he comes. Now, they, they know about Paul because Paul would have been around when Stephen was stoned. Paul was around when Christians are being uh, murdered, when they're being pursued. He, he, he was around in that. And so when he arrives in Jerusalem, Peter, being the good spiritual dad that he is to the young, growing congregation, says, we need to have a meeting. <laughs> so, so Peter meets with this guy to verify that he indeed is truly saved, that he has truly converted to Christianity. There's a whole lot of things that happen to there. And then Paul gets sent out. He, he ministers in the Tarsus region, and then he relocates for a season to Antioch and in Syria. He was a tent maker, so he's working and preaching and teaching and making tents and working and preaching and teaching and making tents. And so he's doing that throughout Syria. Then he travels with Barnabas to visit Jerusalem. And he brings, there was a famine that was going on in Jerusalem at that time. And where he was staying, they had some extras. So they bring the extras to be a blessing to the church in Jerusalem where it all began. And then in AD 46, 47 is when his first missionary journey with Barnabas is. So notice, he's converted in AD 37. And then about 10 years later, almost 10 years later, he finally goes on his first missions trip. Sometimes we read the Bible and we think Paul gets saved and then he did this and then he did this and there he went. And blah, 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 blah. We don't realize that there was a process with the promise God had. How many of you would say, I'm still in process? <laughs> I'm still in process. So he goes on his first missionary journey and then he comes back and he attends. They have this big meeting in Acts chapter 15 called the Jerusalem Council. And he meets with everybody there. And then from there, they begin to send him out on others. So in AD 51, he goes on his second missionary journey. Now at that time, this is the trip, his second journey, where he would plant the church in Philippi, which we're reading about in the book of Philippians. So he would go out on this next journey, and, and they were going, and this is where he has the, the vision, and he, he has the man from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. So they shift gears from going into Asia, and they end up heading over into Philippi, and that's where he meets Lydia. So that's where he meets Lydia, the jailer, Paul and Silas. They're worshiping, they're praying. All of a sudden, the jail cell begins to shake. There's a massive earthquake. He tells the jailer, don't take your own life, man. We got you. We're not going anywhere. The jailer's like, man, you guys are amazing. What do I got to do to believe in your God? What do I got to do to be saved? And they lead him. And those are the founding members of the church in Philippi. So then later on, uh, Paul ends up back in Jerusalem, and he gets arrested, as Paul did, uh, so he gets arrested for what he's doing for Christ, and he, that was during uh, Roman Governor Felix's reign. And then he's held in Caesarea for two years. Then he's put back on trial by Festus, who becomes the new Roman governor. 
And then he gets sent and puts under house arrest in Rome in 61, 63. Later on, he's released from house arrest. He's in prison in Rome again. And then he's martyred under Nero's persecution of the church. But it's this time here in AD 61 to 63, it's during that time in house arrest in Rome, that he actually writes this letter. And the reason that he's writing this letter to the Philippians is because he's saying thank you. It's a thank you letter. And, and you know, here we might write a thank you letter to somebody and we're going to see him next week. There you would write a thank you letter. You may not see them for a few years. And so he writes this thank you letter to them. And he decides to spend a little bit more time unpacking what he wants to encourage them with. Like he, he's, he's Papa Paul. He's like the grandpa that helped to found the church. He's the spiritual dad, the leader. So he's writing them. And this is one of the few letters where he does not actually rebuke them. <laughs> this is one of the few letters. This is one of the few churches that get a letter from Paul. And he doesn't, he's not bringing correction. He's actually encouraging them. And one of the areas that he encourages them in is joy. The reason he encourages them with joy is because the church of Philippi is prime, that region is primarily filled with a bunch of ex military men. Has anybody uh, ever served in the military? Thank you for your service. And not saying this about Brother Bob over here, but as a whole, when you think of military men, do you think smiley, joyful guys? Most people would say no. <laughs> They're hard-nosed. They've been trained for battle. They've gone through some stuff. They have some scars. They've lost friends, family, etc. And so what is a big message of Paul's letter to these guys? He's, he's not rebuking them. He's encouraging them. He says, hey, man, you need some more joy in your life. And he encourages. That's one of the main themes of the message. And, and it, my question for us is, as we begin this letter is what is God putting in your hands? What, what is the good work? that God has began for you, and what is God telling you to lean into? I, I love uh, verse 6, if we could go to that one. Verse 6 says, I'm sure of this. Paul's confident. I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. If God began the work, he's going to finish it. My question for us today is, did God begin the work, or did you? I don't know about you, but there's times in my life where I can look back at some of the things that I've done, and I'm like, man, that wasn't God. That was Jeff. We made those decisions. They weren't prayerful decisions. They were motivated by other things. That decision wasn't to bring you glory. It was to expand our home, our glory, whatever it might be. Glory is kind of a funny word. It's, it, instead of making God famous, it was going to make you famous. Like, what, what's the motivation for what you're doing? Did God begin that work or did you? I, I like how um, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, I like how it says it in the message translation. It says, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep it, keep at it, and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. Let me read that again. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. I'm praying for a flourishing finish for you, for our church family. God wants to see you flourish. He doesn't want you to finish. He doesn't want you to walk away until he calls you home. God's begun the work. We're all processed with a promise for a purpose. He's begun the work. I almost titled this message, You're a Piece of Work. <laughs> but we went with the one that sounded a little bit nicer. <laughs> Come on, you can say, it. I'm a piece of work. You can just say it, just say it, just let it out. I'm a piece of work. Come on, I'm a piece of work. So, Good works. So there's, there's, there's good works. Good works are those that God began and that he is calling you to steward. So the question is, what work did God actually begin that you're the steward of? Now there's three types of works that you see that are very plain. The three types of works is works from God, works from man, and then works from the devil. People, there is a real devil. There is a real hell. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. 
He wants to rob you. He wants to leave you feeling full of shame and naked and embarrassed, looking like an idiot. That's the devil's plan for your life. That's what he wants to do. God wants to cover you. God wants to restore you. God wants to redeem you. He wants to move in your life in a way that's going to bring him glory and that you would have a flourishing finish. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says this, if anyone builds on this foundation, this is Paul writing to the Corinthian church, who he founded on the same journey when he, when he began the church in Philippi, he continued on and then ended up uh, beginning the church in Corinthians. Corinthians had a lot more problems than the Philippians did. So Paul, a lot of the two letters to the Corinthians, it comes with a, a, a heavy hand from, uh, from dad. And so he says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If, it is, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive the rewards. You got three works. Works that you would do for God, works that you would do for yourself, or works that you would inadvertently do for the devil. My question is, is it God's doing in your life or is it your own? And maybe you're here today and there's some works that you've put your hand to. There's relationships you've put energy into. There's things that you are currently holding on to, things that you're pursuing, things that you're doing. My question is, are these works God's doing? Or was it just a good idea? Some things start out as a good idea, kind of a stopgap, things we need to do, etc., there might have been a relationship that started out of convenience, but now that friendship or that romantic interest, now it's actually pulling you away from God rather than pushing you towards God. What are you holding on? Is that something that God started or is that something that you started? If it's God's doing, it will bring him glory. If it's your doing, then you may need to submit that to God and ask him to redeem it. If it's your doing, it could be a good work, it might be your physical work, it might be your physical job or your business, and you started it because you just needed to, and God's saying, hey, I actually want to help you, I want to partner with you in that business, can you submit that to me and let me redeem what you started with your hands, if you'll put it in my hands, it will really flourish. Let's go to work together. Or he might say, that's not what I have for you, I'm asking you to drop that and lay that down. I remember my wife and I had one of those moments. We had built a house in Texas, and I've shared this story a few times, but for those of you new, uh, this will be brand new to you. For those of you that heard before, chicken tastes better sometimes the second time. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> whatever the saying is. Um, but we, we built this house, and it's beautiful. It's got two dishwashers. We're excited about it. Um, we didn't overextend ourselves. We we actually are... are, are that cost of the house was the equivalent to about our, our year's income. So it was well within our budget. It wasn't anything ridiculous. And so at that time, we were just going through. And the, and the last thing you do before you take the keys of the house and finalize the paperwork is you go through, and they, they call it blue taping. The contractors give you a thing of tape, and you just go around with painter's tape, and you just show them all the things you don't like. This cabinet's off. This is, it needs to be reset. This isn't screwed down. There's a scuff on the wall, whatever it might be. So we're going through with blue tape and having a fun time and going through the whole house and walking through the downstairs and into our massive master bedroom and cool closet and everything. We're just like, man, I can't believe we're going to be here. This is going to be so awesome. And as we're blue taping the place, the Holy Spirit says to me, this is not what I have for you. And I'm like, you have to tell Fawn, because she will kill me tonight <laughs> if I tell her we're not buying this house. We already bought it. Like, what are we doing? Like, we just need to sign the papers. And we're, I mean, we're pretty much done. And so we walk out of there, and I'm kind of like, you know, there's times where you pray, and then there's times where you're like praying under your breath, and you're like, oh, Shabbat 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 How's this going to go? Right? You're nervous. The nervous prayer, right? And so I'm the nervous praying, you know, we get in the car, and Fawn's like, what do you think? I'm like, that's great. <laughs> What do you think? She's like, I just feel like we're not supposed to do this. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Well, I heard God. <laughs> we both heard God. So long story short, we walk away, and it was so embarrassing to me. Like, the realtor that was helping us was a friend of the family. He had helped all of our family buy houses. He's helping us. Could torch that relationship. 
the builder. We got to know them. When you're building a house, you get to know them pretty, pretty close, maybe closer than you'd like when people are doing work at your house, right? You know, you get to know them pretty close, and that relationship's going to be gone. We're going to be moving down the street from family members that were living in the same community in the region, and now, now we're not, and kind of signaling to the family, like, what in the world is Jeff and Fawn doing? And it, it, was, it was embarrassing. But I would tell you that as an illustration, as an example, maybe there's something like that in your life. Maybe there's a house that you've gone through and blue taped, and the Lord is saying, this is actually not what I have for you. Maybe there's a relationship, a friendship, or a, a romantic interest, and the Lord says, uh, that was birthed out of convenience, and just because you could doesn't mean you should, and I'm asking you to resubmit that to me. Like, and the question is, how do you know? Like, how, how, how do you know that's God? How do you know it's not God? Number one, in that illustration I just gave you, my wife and I, we were on the same page. So I had confirmation in my heart that this was the right decision because Fawn also shared that. So she felt that. Another way that you might tell, let me just go down the line. Let me use a, let me use a dating illustration. Let me use a romantic illustration for those of you that are single or, or dating in the room. A great thing to do, and I, I've been so honored when people have done this with Fawn and I, is if somebody was romantically interested in somebody, they'd say, hey, can I ask you a question? What do you think of her? What do you see? Are you concerned about if, if we start dating? Would you see any red flags? And that gives me a permission to speak into their life and share. And I'm very cautious about what I would say in a situation like that. If somebody invites you into a moment like that, you, you better be sure that you're operating in wisdom and base it on the word of God and not just like a feeling. But if there's things that you sense, you know, kind of like your spidey sense is going off, your spiritual spidey sense, you think, man, some, I don't know, they seem nice, like she seems sweet, but I just kind of have, there's, just, there's a concern here in this area. When you feel that, you need to take that and submit that to the Lord. So I encourage people when they're dating I encourage the, the, the young man or the young woman, I encourage them, go, go to their parents, go to leaders, go to pastors, say, hey, look, we're interested in each other, we like each other, can I just get your feedback? What would you think? Like, is, do you see any red flags with me dating right now? Do you see any red flags with this person I'm interested in? Do you see any red flags in our relationship in this, whatever, that's just one example. Another, you know, you, you could take that same type of illustration, you can apply it to business. Hey, look, I'm still going to start in this company, I'm looking to start in this new business. Uh, this is what we have, this is how much finances we have, this is the over-under on it. Getting wise counsel is a good way to see if it's truly from God. So is it God's doing, works that bring him glory, or is it my doing, works that are going to bring me glory? If it's your doing, then submit it to God to be redeemed. And if it's not of God, well, what do you do then? You repent. You pray and obey. Like when the Lord told me, this is not what I have for you, that was followed by a rebuke. Like he said, you never even asked me about buying this house, which seems so foolish. And again, this was totally embarrassing in our marriage, you know. But we really didn't seek God on it. It's kind of like we had the money there was a house we wanted, you know, kind of seemed like it was an easy equation, but I learned a very valuable lesson that just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because it looks good doesn't mean that it is God. So submitting that. And then lastly, if it's not God's doing or yours doing, is it the devil's doing? Now, if it's the devil's doing, this is easy. Submit to God, take authority over that area, rebuke it in Jesus' name. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Throughout scriptures, you'll see things like this, and I just want to, if you're new to the Bible, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a cheat code. He's telling you what to do. Like, so here's the equation. If you want to see the devil flee from your life, submit to God. If you want to see the devil flee from your life, you'll have to resist him. Like God, God is, he wants to do the work that he started, but he needs you to partner with him. Like you have to submit that thing. You have to submit to God. There is the good work that he began that he will finish, but here in the process, brother, you're gonna have to work. You're gonna have to steward that thing. And stewardship doesn't look like striving. 
Stewardship takes work, but it's not striving. Stewardship says, God, I'm, I'm carrying this, and I want to honor you with what you've placed in my hands. A lot of times when people are making wrong decisions, they're usually basing it out of fear and not out of faith. They'll dress it up as faith. <laughs> They'll quote a scripture over it. But a lot of times, they're running from something. And, the, and in their running away from something, they don't realize they're actually making a fear-based decision. Fear will cause you to run. The Bible says that the, the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. They're steps. They're steps you're walking into. Sometimes your step feels like a great leap, but in God's eyes, he's like, it's just a step, and I'll help you take the next step. And after you take that one, I'll help you take the next step. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee. If, you're, if you need to see breakthrough in an area of your life, I want to encourage you. Are you truly submitting that to God? If you haven't seen breakthrough in that, in that area of your life, is it fully submitted to God? I would challenge you, it may not be. And if it's something where you're just working through, great. Get wisdom, get counsel to make sure that you're putting your hand to the right plow and not wasting your time. Because here's, here's the big idea. Next slide. If, it, if his hand's not on it, then you don't want it. If God's hand's not on that relationship, I'm telling you, you don't want it. If God's hand's not on that business, you don't want it. If God's hand's not on that partnership, you don't want it. That is a ship that is sure to sink, okay? If his hands are not on it, you don't want it. Remember, there is, there is a process. David, as an example, David was anointed as king when he was a boy. Most theologians believe that he was anywhere from 10 to 15 years old. When uh, the prophet shows up at Jesse, his dad's house, and calls out all the different, his brothers. And, uh, and then they're like, is there one more? Is, there any, is this all you have? And he goes, oh, I do have the young one, but he's out in the field. Most people think he would have been like 10 to 15 years old at that time. And uh, so he comes, and you know the story. The prophet then anoints him with oil. But what did David do after he was anointed with oil? He wasn't crowned king. You know what he did? He went back with the stinky sheep out in the desert all by himself, stewarding what God had for him to steward. Some people feel like, I'm anointed, and they want to jump right into the throne and be crowned king in their whatever their endeavor might be. God has a process. So David goes through this. So he gets anointed king, and I'm sure he was excited, kind of perplexed, but kind of like, am I really? I'm really being anointed king by the prophet? Like the pro I can't believe this. His brothers are really like, I can't believe this, right? David goes back into the wilderness, and he's with the sheep, and he's taking care of them. Then there's a big battle that's raging, and there's this guy, Goliath, that's coming out, and he's cursing God. And David shows up to deliver food. He's door dashing for his dad, bringing food to his brothers on the front lines. At this time of David's life, we don't know exactly how old he is, but we know he's not 20 years old. Because if you're 20, you would serve in the military. If you weren't 20, if you were under 20 years old, you were not allowed to serve in the military. So David is somewhere between 15 and 20, most theologians believe. So he shows up on the front lines with the food. And then he's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine talking about my God this way? What are you guys doing, cowards, you know? And he rises up, and then he finds out what you get. If you go and take this guy out, like, I get the king's daughter. <laughs> I, get, I don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> Dude, let me at him. <laughs> There's different motivations. But God led him, and God led that rock, hits Goliath, and he, he takes Goliath's own sword. He takes what the enemy meant for evil, and he takes it, and he cuts the enemy's head off with that sword. That could be a whole awesome message there, but we won't we'll refrain from going too far down the line. But David, there was a process that he went through. He was anointed, 10 to 15 years old, later on defeats Goliath. He's still not anointed king after Goliath. It wasn't until he's 30 years old when he actually assumes the place of king. 30 years old. And that, that's one of the reasons why in Judaism you would not be allowed to be a rabbi until you were 30 years old. They base it on the Davidic call. And that's why one of the reasons Jesus, he, he, that was a setup for Jesus to fulfill his calling when he began his ministry at 30. That's a whole deep dive. Anyways, if God's hands are not on it, you don't want it. Habakkuk 2.3 says this, the vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, 
Wait for it. Wait patiently. It will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Some of you forget. We, we love that scripture in Habakkuk chapter 2 too, right? Write the vision. Make it plain that a herald may run with it. I'm right. I got my vision board. I got all these things on my vision board. I'm, I'm that guy. I got my vision board. I got everything. But we forget that there's a process that God's going to take you through to actually see that vision come to pass. But wait for it. If it's from God, it's going to come. Because he who began the good work in you will complete it. Amen? Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, going back to Paul. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So Paul's sharing different things in his life. He's in the jail at this time, or under house arrest. It's not a, a difficult jail. He's under house arrest. He's got visitors, visitors that come and go, and people are concerned for him. And he says, I want you to know I know you're concerned for me, but what's going on here in my life, this is actually being used to advance the gospel. What area of your life have you wanted to get out of house arrest? What area do you feel like you're kind of stuck in the season, I'm in process, where you're like, man, I, I, just, I just want out of this, where you've lost the perspective that maybe, just maybe, God is using this or will use this, or will redeem this to advance the gospel. You're in process. Parents, by the way, your children are in process. There is a promise. They're in process with a promise for a purpose. Don't lose hope in your children. If you're here in the room and you feel like, man, the process is too much for me at times. <laughs> I feel overwhelmed by the process. I, I just want God to like wave a, a fairy wand of pixie dust over me and everything's going to be great. I would love for that to happen. I have not found that to be the way because God who begins the work, who's going to finish the work, places now in your hands the work to steward. And if he can work with you, through whatever you might be going through, it's going to be get better for you, and it's going to advance the gospel and impact the kingdom. Amen? I want to invite uh, the worship team to join me up at the front as we close today. And, you know, if you're sitting here and you're feeling like, man, that process is too much, I, I think I've disqualified myself. I've disqualified myself from the process. I want to encourage you with this. Uh, nobody is done processing yet in this room. If you're fully processed, you're not here anymore, you're with the Lord. <laughs> but if you're still here, that means you're still in process. And there, there is no perfect people in the body of Christ. There is our perfect Lord and Savior who is perfecting us. He is transforming us. He is growing us. Romans 3.23 would remind you today that everyone has sinned. Everybody's fallen short of God's glorious standard. I have, you have, we all have. Yippee. Everybody has fallen short of the glorious standard of God. Don't let the fact of where you're at in the process deter you from the process. Embrace the process. Embrace what God's doing in your life. Some of you need to be reminded. <laughs> you may not be where you want to be, but you ain't where you used to be. You may not be where you want to be, but you ain't where you used to be. Look at what God has done in your life. Take a moment to celebrate the growth. Take a moment to celebrate the process. Take a moment to celebrate the fact that you're sitting in a church on a Sunday morning. For some of you, five years ago, you're like, I never could have seen that happen. Ten years ago, I never could have seen that happen. An hour ago, you might have been like, I could never see that happen. And somebody invited you and promised you lunch after service today so you came you're here like man celebrate what God is doing in your life where you're at in the process God is doing it he's working in you he's working things together he's advancing you you may not feel like it faith isn't a feeling look at what God has done God, I trust your process. Some of you just need to tell him, God, I trust your process. I know you began a good work, and I want to steward it. Help me trust the process. Help me hold on to the promise that you give. 
Help me to hold on to those promises that you have for me for a purpose. Jesus says this in John 6, 37. He says, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Some of you, you feel like, I don't know if I can come to God. Like Jesus is saying, I will never drive you away. If you come to me, I'm never going to push you away. You might be here today and your parents might have pushed you away. Friends and family might have pushed you away, giving you a bit of a social stiff arm. And Jesus is like, I'll never do that to you. I draw near to those who draw near to me, James 4, 8. He's drawing near to you, draw near to him. You're in process with a promise for a purpose. Romans 10, 13, we say it almost every Sunday. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise. That's a promise. If you've prayed that prayer, if you've declared Jesus is your Lord, you started that process. Actually, he started the process. And I love how Paul reminds them in the Philippians. He's like, he who began a good work in you. Paul's not saying he began the work. Paul was just a servant, a bond servant, he calls himself. He was just a servant that came to deliver the message. But that work began before he hit the shores in Philippi. That work began before he left Jerusalem. There is a work that God is beginning in hearts and minds all around you, friends, family, people, strangers you'll meet this week. There's a work that God has began. You get to be a messenger and see them embrace that process that they could take hold of the promise that God has for them. For more information on Authentic Church, visit us online at AuthenticOC.com.